ahead of its time. The great civilization of ancient Egypt, with its dramatic spectacle and mystery, has always fascinated me. I've been traveling the country to explore some of the intriguing stories that have emerged from this historic land. In this program, I'm setting off to discover how and why the ancient Egyptians made things to last forever, fueled by their belief in eternity. The remarkable thing about ancient Egypt is that so much survives for us to marvel at. Up to 4,600 year techniques of building for eternity. And some of those techniques were ingenious. I want to see how these Egyptians prepared for the afterlife. So I've come here to see the beginning of the desire to build for eternity. I'm at Saqqara, where 4,600 years ago, the pharaoh Zosa built this great pyramid. It marks the pharaoh's burial place, where he would enter the afterlife. So the belief his successful entry and survival in the afterlife depended on the survival of his body and of this monument. Masonry constructions, but also just look at its sublime elemental geometry. It's so powerful, so beautiful. What's extraordinary about this pyramid, given its perfect form, is the way in which it developed in a rather ad hoc manner. Originally, there were these shafts dug below it, burial shafts and chambers in which to keep treasures, and these shafts were topped by a mastaba, or so horizontal slab. A single horizontal slab was a traditional tomb monument at the time. But Zosa realised that by using stone, he could build a larger, taller structure, and last even longer. The original smaller structure is still visible in the walls we see now. The pyramid is just part of a large funerary complex, which also shows Zosa's ambition to build for eternity. Up till then, large structures had been made for materials that didn't last, such as reeds, timber, and palm stems. Zosa found a way to imitate these traditional, perishable materials with something more permanent. The entire funeral co new and more long-lasting materials, and we see something similar happening here. Amazing. A mighty, symbolic gate open. Even it has great hinges, but rather than being made of timber, the leaves of this great gate are made of stone, certainly a gate worthy of lasting for eternity. In this colonnaded hall, we can see more evidence. Traditionally, columns are made out of palm stems tied together. Here we can see palm stems, but made in stone. Directly and dramatically, how building practice evolved to create a monumental stone-built architecture that would last for eternity. As for pyramids, Zosa promoted the idea that solidity and size mattered if you want to live forever. And that led to something staggering a few miles down the Nile. The golden age of pyramid construction started at Saqqara, lasted for only around 100 years and reached its high point here at Giza. The builders of these three giants aimed for permanence and succeeded. Of the seven wonders of the ancient world, these pyramids are all that remain. The Great Pyramid at Giza was started about 70 years after the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. Certainly, it is the epitome of pyramid architecture. It's designed and constructed with incredible accuracy and, of course, on an heroic scale. The pyramids orientated very exactly to the four points of the compass and it is level to within two centimeters from one corner to the other. Incredible accuracy. The service is 
tomb, in which case that man certainly had an eye to eternity. This thing really is a force of nature built to last forever. It took a brilliant feat of engineering to turn Khufu's dream of immortality into reality. So how did the Egyptians do it? To start with, they had to cut and haul huge blocks of limestone. I'm standing in the remains of an ancient quarry. I can see all around me these square areas. These represent the bases of great stones that once rose above me. And these stones, this limestone, was cut away using the most basic, most primitive of Bronze Age technology, simply soft bronze or copper chisels. And then these great blocks had to be lifted using not sort of... Um, and to see where they went, you simply have to look over there. Working out how the limestone blocks were assembled to form the Great Pyramid has kept engineers and archaeologists busy for years. The Great Pyramid may have ensured Khufu immortality and a place among the gods, but its construction must have involved getting labour and funds from all over the country. No one ever attempted anything on such a scale again. Even Khufu's own son, Khafre, and his grandson, Menkere, had to settle for smaller pyramids nearby. If it wasn't possible to build bigger, then new ways were needed to make the monuments last, such as using even tougher materials. Details of the three pyramids at Giza show a continuing obsession with eternity. The first two pyramids were clad with a fine limestone. See that still there on the top of Khafre's pyramid. There it is, the limestone. But here, the third pyramid, pyramid of Menkere, is clad not with limestone, but with granite, granite much harder than limestone. And here you see these blocks rising up and then stopping. And more amazing, these great blocks of granite were to be smoothed off to give the pyramid a fantastic sheer surface. And that happened over here. Look at this, the great block of granite smoothed to make this lovely, Facade. What ambition! Out the country. But what really impresses me is the effort that went into getting the stone. There's no granite suitable for building anywhere in northern Egypt. To trace the source of the rock, my journey took me 600 miles south of Giza to Aswan. Here I found the only source of building granite in Egypt, a truly ancient quarry. It looked like it was still in use, and the stone cutters had just gone, or would have been, if completed and directed. It's absolutely huge. This monster was carved out on three sides, around three, by the pharaoh, Tuthmosis III. It's a marvellous snapshot of Egyptian technology, preserved simply because granite is so good at resisting erosion. This is absolutely awe-inspiring. Towards its tip, the obelisk would have been, well, well over two would have been useless on this material. Utterly, utterly fantastic. But something went horribly wrong. This great obelisk almost reaching its bottom here for the fourth face to be cut was about of thousands of tons of granite used to help ensure a long afterlife for many pharaohs. The granite must have been carried to temples and tombs throughout the country by floating it down the Nile. It would have been an extraordinary operation. Stone was carried along this great river because it was the Nile that inspired the belief in an afterlife in the first place. It's not surprising that the Nile was no gods. It seemed to them to be the fertile centre of the world, a wondrous paradise. But the Nile's also like a great natural clock, marking the turning of the world, seasons coming and going and coming again. The annual flood of the Nile, bringing life to parched land, 
They'd have seen plants germinating and dying and living again. And of course, that gave the idea of the cycle of life brought to life by the Nile. It's not such a big step to imagine that something similar could happen to human life. I can see why, just as the crops were renewed each season, ancient Egyptians should believe that after death, they too could be renewed. But crucially, for them to be renewed and attain afterlife, the body had to be preserved so that a new, finer being, their soul, could grow from it, could germinate. What's more, their spiritual soul had regularly to return to the preserved body. This was their real challenge, to stop the body decomposing. They would have noticed that when the dead were buried in the desert sand, they were preserved naturally. The bodies dried out before they could decay. So the ancient Egyptians developed mummification, a technique that preserved the human body in a similar way. It's another example of how their great practical skills were put to the service of their belief in eternity. In front of me lies the body of a young woman. She died around 2,000 years ago. She's been mummified. And the process of mummification is absolutely fascinating. They realise that the decay of the body starts within the organs. The organs had to be removed, but very carefully indeed. The brain had to be extracted without damaging the skull with a special tool inserted, usually at the left nostril, and the brain would be pulled out. In the process of this extraction, the brain would be virtually destroyed. It didn't matter, though. They didn't reckon the brain was very important. Other organs, though, are preserved. Inside here, the heart, the liver, the lungs, intestine, all had to be taken out. Now, four of these organs are preserved in these canopic jars. These have um, lovely little lids showing the four sons of Horus. Horus, of course, the son of Osiris, the lord of the underworld. The heart, though, is treated differently. That's preserved and then reinserted into the empty husk of the body. The heart was very important because that was seen as the, uh, the place of the soul where the soul resided and the soul had to face judgment in the underworld. The body is then um, preserved by being packed with natron. Natron is a form of natural salt, removes the water, preserves the flesh. And so there, this body is wrapped in me, bearing a selection of special instruments. And the object was to reanimate the dead, to allow their senses to work in the afterlife, so they could hear and see and take nourishment. In a sense, it allowed the dead to live in the land of Osiris. So preparing for a life in eternity didn't just depend on the skills of the embalmers. The rituals associated with burial were vital if the person was to live on in the afterlife. We know many of these rituals from tomb paintings. For instance, here, the opening of the mouth ceremony is being performed on the dead pharaoh Tutankhamun. Tombs also give us an idea of what living in the afterlife was like. It was shown as an agricultural paradise, sometimes called the Field of Reeds, where life was an idealised version of the existence the dead had left behind. But what really fascinates me is the help the dead were given to ease their life in the Field of Reeds. Entombed with a mummy were small helper figures that would be animated by magic spells when things got too arduous in the underworld. Here's a model granary. Shows people preparing grain and storing grain up here, grain store. And here's someone grinding up the grain. And uh, they have a very specific function. This one has a spell carved into it here, Shabti spell. And this explains what it does. It toils, it works for the dead, to relieve the dead 
of the need to labour in paradise. And this one, it says, um, is to sort of shift sand, and he's carrying his, the tools of his trade here, a little hoe, shifting sand to create irrigation ditches, always the same water fertility, as in Egypt around the Nile, water is life, so digging irrigation ditches is very important in paradise. <laughs> um, this one has a, the name of the dead, lovely little blue figure. Oh look, with a little sort of work basket for carrying the sand, just to make sure that the, um, the dead person in tomb with this figure could have a relaxing time in uh, the kingdom of Osiris. Very nice. Scribed in oval-shaped cartouches. Tuthmosis III. Ramesses II. Tutankhamun. Horemheb. The shape is based on the circular hieroglyph meaning eternity. So by placing the name within it, the pharaoh symbolically lived forever. But for ancient Egyptians, for all their sense of eternity, for all their great monuments and their mummified bodies, the onward march of time couldn't be taken for granted. The annual flooding of the Nile, even the rising of the sun, depended on pleasing the gods with rites and rituals in temples. Temples were the engines of eternity, where the forces of chaos and darkness were kept at bay, where divine harmony was maintained, and the state of the living and those in the afterlife preserved. So a temple had to last forever. Even the ancient Egyptian word for a temple means house of the millions of years. I travelled down the Nile to the temple at Dendera. Here you can tell from the massive architecture that is made to last. The solid temple building represented order and stability. While surrounding it is a gigantic perimeter wall keeping out the forces of chaos. Temple and all of this of course served a very particular purpose. It was to act as a, a machine, really, a machine for regulating the earth, for renewing the earth. Nature was observed, the cycle of life observed and follows. And in front of me is a shrine the goddess here. It was really to worship nature, to ensure the world continued to exist, to ensure that the world that man enjoyed would be here for future generations, would ensure that the sun would rise on the morrow. So the apparatus of eternity was all there. Could eternity stay the course? Eventually, the idea that things could last forever was severely tested. Egyptian civilization lasted a very long time. When Ramesses II started this mortuary temple for himself, some people would have noticed that tombs had been abandoned and robbed, mummies unwrapped, and the jewels plucked from within them, and temples themselves abandoned and left to fall into decay. This temple of Ramesses II was most probably damaged by an earthquake in antiquity, and its collapse hastened by its later use as a quarry for building stone. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands. The names of the pharaohs and their gods in temples such as these, the houses of the millions of years. Ramesses II and Tutankhamun are once again household names. And while their names live on, so, in a sense, do they. Next time, I'm following the story of one intriguing woman ahead of its time. The great civilization of ancient Egypt, with its dramatic spectacle and mystery, has always fascinated me. I've been travelling the country to explore some of the intriguing stories that have emerged from this historic land. 
In this programme, I'm setting off to discover how and why the ancient Egyptians made things to last forever, fueled by their belief in eternity. The remarkable thing about ancient Egypt is that so much survives for us to marvel at. Up to 4,600 year techniques of building for eternity. And some of those techniques were ingenious. I want to see how these Egyptians prepared for the afterlife. So I've come here to see the beginning of the desire to build for eternity. I'm at Saqqara where 4,000 form is the way in which it developed in a rather ad hoc manner. Originally, there were these shafts dug below it, burial shafts and chambers in which to keep treasures, and these shafts were topped by a mastaba, a horizontal slab. A single horizontal slab was a traditional tomb monument at the time, but Zosa realised that by using stone, he could build a larger, taller structure, and last even longer. The original smaller structure is still visible in the walls we see now. 600 years ago, the pharaoh Zosa built this great pyramid. It marks the pharaoh's burial place, where he would enter the afterlife. Zosa believed his successful entry and survival in the afterlife depended on the survival of his body and of this monument. Masonry construction, but also just look at its sublime elemental Geometry is so powerful, so beautiful. What's extraordinary about this pyramid, given its perfect owl? Oh. The pyramid is just part of a large funerary complex, which also shows Zosa's ambition to build for eternity. Up till then, large structures had been made from materials that didn't last, such as reeds, timber and palm stems. Zosa found a way to imitate these traditional, perishable materials with something more permanent. The entire funeral co and more long-lasting materials, and we see something similar happening here. Amazing. A mighty 